hi there my friends welcome to my youtube channel today i'm working in watercolors i've got a piece of arches 140 pound cold press paper it's 100 percent cotton size a3 which is roughly 12 by 17 inches i've taped it down to a board with acid free masking tape i've put on a sketch of just the outline actually of a reindeer a caribou i will go between those two words today and i'm applying well i first applied some droplets of water deionized water with a little spray bottle so it's very random uh, random droplets of water and i'm using core watercolor paints the three colors i'm using are ultramarine blue nickel azo yellow and pyrrole red light and i will be using a little bit of van gogh neutral tint later on so the idea with this is it's called spontaneous watercolor painting and that's how the background is being applied and it's literally you get some water onto the paper apply some paint and just let the watercolor do its thing uh, applying a little bit of water around the edges with the Derwent Mister and that's just to create a little bit more freedom for the paint to move and it also if you do it around the edges it lets the paint just bleed out and go out of focus so there's no hard edges. Uh, just mopping up the drips of water that are going down the reindeer. The reindeer is masked out uh, with frisket masking film and some Windsor and Newton masking fluid. If you can see right in the middle of the reindeer, the uh, paint has leaked through. That's my fault, <laughs> not, not the products. I didn't overlap the masking film properly, but that's fine. That little bit of staining on the paper in the middle of the deer will be covered up on later um, layers of paint. So that's great. Just letting the watercolour do its own thing as it hits droplets of water the paint will just bleed out and create little patterns and textures in the on the paper so it's very random uh, but it's a lovely way to to work i do have another painting on the channel on my youtube channel uh, about a spontaneous watercolour painting so if you're interested that's a landscape um, yeah take a look at that later if you want so it's all about just adding pigment to the paper letting the paint do its own thing um, and see what happens it's a lovely way of working it's very relaxing so this is the second time of filming uh, sorry recording this voiceover the first voiceover didn't record properly for some reason not sure why <clears throat> excuse me but hey ho these things happen and i'm guessing they happen for a reason who knows so i've put the finished painting at the top left hand corner there so you can actually see where this painting is heading um no reference image for the background just making it up as i go along and uh letting the paint tell the story and i just follow along and Oh, it is, it's a lovely way to work. So working with a limited palette. So because I'm using ultramarine blue, nickel, azo, yellow and pyrrole red light, I have three primary colours, blue, yellow and red. If you're unsure about what colours to use on a painting um, and you're new to painting, then I do suggest that you use a, a limited palette and maybe just have a play session where you just take three colors and see what colors you can actually mix from them so some limited palettes might work for you others not depends what you get want to get out of a painting the painting i did refer to um that's also on my youtube channel i use the same colors so already i knew straight the way that these colors were going to work and i was going to be able to achieve what i had in mind but if in doubt have a play on a separate piece of paper and what I will mention at this point is when I was applying the Windsor & Newton masking fluid right at the very beginning before um, I started recording, I did flick some into the foreground as well. I got a little bit of the Windsor & Newton masking fluid in a cup. 
added a little bit of water, gave it a stir and then flicked that onto the foreground. So later on in the video you'll see me rubbing away the masking fluid and it re reveals little white spots where the paint hasn't been able to penetrate the paper just to give the foreground a little bit more texture. Adding some um, pure red light there and mixing a little bit of yellow in as well just to create some um, changes in hues in the background. I wanted to keep the background completely out of focus so I didn't go in with any detailing at all in the background. I wanted to look out of focus using cool colours in areas also means it looks like it's further away for the viewer as well. So with depth of field and things like that there's a couple of things you can do to make things look further away. One of them is using by uh, cool colours in a painting for things that you want to look in the distance and also less uh, detailing means it looks further away as well. So just turning the paper upside down so I'm not leaning over anything that's already wet. If I repeat myself I'm so sorry because this is obviously the second time I'm recording this voiceover and yeah <laughs> can't remember what I said in parts of the recording to begin with. So now removing the masking fluid with my finger you have to make sure that your paper is completely dry. So I went away, made a coffee, came back, made sure everything was completely dry before starting to remove that masking fluid. If you if the paper's still damp, it can damage the paper, you, you run the risk of ripping paper. And what I do recommend is if you're using a new type of paper that you haven't used before, maybe a different brand or a different textured paper, try um, your masking techniques on a scrap of paper first, just to make sure that you're not going to have any adverse reactions. Make sure the paper can withstand having um, masking fluid and masking film applied to it and removed. So the last thing you want to do is create a painting then go to remove the masking, um, air, masked areas and then finding that the paper underneath is damaged. As you can see it really did, the paint did stain that area in the middle of the reindeer but I do cover that up in uh, later layers so nothing to worry about. <clears throat> and the reason I didn't just use masking fluid or just used film is if I'd have used masking fluid just masking fluid over the whole reindeer it would have taken a lot of masking fluid to cover that area if I'd have used just masking film I would have had to have delicately cut round all the edges and the antlers and things like that and it would just been too time consuming I'm afraid so uh, just got a little bit of white gouache which is opaque watercolour mixed in some water deionized water and now I'm going to be dipping a toothbrush into that mixture so I can create a little spatter effect. So you just pull the toothbrush back after dipping it in and it just puts a spray of paint onto your surface. Really simple. Just having a play. This I was just playing with this background, background well actually foreground area just while I was thinking about how I was going to apply the um, coats of paint to the reindeer so uh, don't plan ev I, I personally don't plan everything in, in advance and if I'm working in sort of this spontaneous watercolour way then you there's not a lot of planning you can do <laughs> with uh, backgrounds and foregrounds because you have to let the paint do its own thing add in a little bit more uh, white gouache to areas while I'm pondering starting the day and drinking copious amounts of coffee whilst doing so as usual. Sometimes it's fully caffeinated but yeah sometimes it's decaf as well depends how much I've had during the day and what time I'm working. Um, the board I'm working on is set at about 10-15 degrees so it is tilted slightly towards me and I apologize now for the amount of times my head gets in the way, well it's my hair that gets in the way. 
I've tried to edit out um, the worst bits, but uh, I was so engrossed in this painting, I was enjoying it so much that at a couple of moments, I forgot there was a camera filming overhead and uh, yeah, my head just got in the way. So I am playing around at the minute in the studio um, with new filming techniques, I guess, and where the camera's situated and things like that. And all of this was filmed under just daylight. I didn't have any of the studio lights on at all. I just used the light coming in from the window, which is right in front of me. So this, uh, so the antlers, unfortunately, I got my head in the way, but they were just, uh, I just brushed them over with water and then added pigments and let them run. Uh, the same is happening here on the head of the deer. <coughs> excuse me just wet the whole of the head with water and now I'm just dropping the pigment in the little bit of pigment that has bled from the um, muzzle area upwards into the background I just removed that later on with a little rosemary and co scrubber brush and then lifted it out with a tissue so that's not actually in the finished painting just tidied around the edges right at the very end of the painting but just building up the layers, building up the depth of colour and during, during the building up of the colours I'm continually mixing slightly different hues from those four colours, I'm in, including neutral tint in the four colours it's three colours and a neutral tint mixing them up, altering them slightly uh, because the more hues I've got on a painting from a limited palette the better. For me personally in this painting it just seemed to work really well. So the idea of working wet into wet is the avoidance of hard edges. Because this subject is quite small, I mean the paper is only 12 inches by 17 so the subject is quite small really. Um, I didn't want to put any detail in as such, I wanted to keep it looking soft, I wanted to keep it the watercolour painting looking fresh as well and I hope I achieve that. If I wanted any hard lines then I'd work wet into dry so obviously wet paint onto dry paper but I wanted the opposite everything looking soft and as you can see as you add the pigment it just bleeds out into the surrounding area and just yeah stays looking nice and soft. A little bit of a blue hue going in there and the brush I'm using there is Rosemary & Co it's a number six that I've had for about five years and I absolutely love this brush I'll list everything in the description below the paints the paper and the brushes and the masking fluid and film as well so working across the subject in sections uh, it's easy to just think right I've got this this color pigment on my brush I'll just paint everywhere where I want this color but then it can get a bit daunting and you end up with a lot of painting that's a, a lot of the painting that's wet all in one go nowhere to rest your hand I mean the, the uh, issues can just dominate you get a domino effect of different issues but painting just a little bit at a time and working I'm right-handed so I like to work from left to right on especially on this painting um, it just made sense for me on this one pulling the pigment across you can see that stained area there in the middle of the body of the deer but that's fine because that does get covered up later on I've added a little bit of a, a yellow tint to this pigment now that I'm going on just altering the hues as moving across the the subject so as I said I didn't work from a reference for the background because it was just spontaneous watercolor I do have a reference for the deer but I did change it a lot for a start of when I sketched made an initial sketch on a separate piece of paper for the deer 
I didn't like the posture of the head and I didn't like the antlers in the reference image. So I just sat with the coffee, had a play, repositioned the head and the direction of the head because the head in the reference image was looking slightly away from the viewer. And the antlers on the reindeer in the reference image were quite small. So I looked up some other reference images and decided on a separate set of antlers. No red nose, so you can't call him uh, Rudolph. So going, letting the pigment now bleed out into wetted area. So because I didn't want any hard edges along that back end. So the back of the deer, um, the vertical side of the deer on the right hand side, the back of his legs, his hind legs, I want to be facing the light source. So I didn't want any darks on that area at all. The reference image, the deer was, it was very dark. It wasn't completely silhouetted from a backlit. It was backlit, but not completely silhouetted, sorry. I didn't want to paint a deer that dark. It looked too heavy. I and mean, it would have been competing with the darkness that um, I'd achieved in the background. So everybody's, well, not everybody, but a lot of people get hung up on what colors am I using and, and things like that. I will give you the colours, um, but they're being mixed on a palette. So the colours you start with aren't necessarily the colours that you finish your painting with. Because while your colours are in the palette, they're constantly being mixed to create different hues. So when I was painting the face and popping the eye in, my head was in the way. But as I said, I was so engrossed in this painting, I forgot I'd got a camera right overhead. So I'm sorry about that. But the depth of the colour in the face was just um, achieved by using wet in wet washes and just building up that intensity of colour. The eye was created just using dark pigment wet on dry. So I didn't uh, pre-wet the eye area. I just popped in a little bit of pigment being very careful to leave the highlight in the eye showing. I could have gone on top with um, white gouache if I had gone over the place where I needed a highlight but thankfully I was in control because my head was right over it I could see what I was doing and as you can see you can see the white spatter nice effect on the foreground and mid ground area I do go in at the very end of the painting and apply some more so some of it hits the actual subject as well so just mixing up some pigments I think yeah so I've already gone over this leg uh, just with water, so deionized water, and now I'm applying pigment just to darken it and wet in wet leaves no hard edges. Now the reason I use deionized water is because tap water contains chemicals such as chlorine, uh, fluoride and different things I believe. And for the longevity of a painting, I don't know what effects that would have on your paints and paper. So I'm using acid-free paper, acid-free masking tape, artist quality masking materials, artist quality everything really. Um, and there's no point in adding chemicals into that mix if you don't have to. And deionized water is so cheap you can get a big tub of it for just a few pounds. You only need a little bit of it for watercolours and it's not going to have an, any adverse effects because there's no chemicals in it. That's why I use deionised water. So water ball uh, mixed mediums I use deionised water with such as watercolours and gouache, watercolour pencils, water soluble ink, some water soluble wax things like that water soluble graphite anything like that I'll use the deionized water if I'm painting in acrylics I'm, I'm not so worried about um, using tap water and I'll wash my brushes out and things like that with normal tap water when using acrylics but for water-based products it is nice just to use deionized water
add in a little bit more pigment there and I see you can just see that it's a little bit of a warmer hue so mixing up the hues changing the hues as you work on a subject just adds to the interest it stops it from looking flat and keeping in mind where the light source is coming from helps as well right the way through a project if you're after uh, reference images to create paintings from then I, I can thoroughly um, not suggest yeah I'll, I'll suggest two websites I thoroughly recommend them that's what I'll do and that's unsplash.com and pixabay.com and they're two online resources that I use regularly um, so obviously I do like to work from my own reference images but if there's something that I haven't got then I look on those two sites and nine times out of ten um, there's something I can utilize it's not very often I just use one reference image and just work from that so I generally sketch from a few different reference images to create um, a pleasing composition and pose for a subject so just applying water now because uh, I'm going to be working wet in wet and the best thing about working wet in wet is you're less likely to get any hard edges on your painting now because this painting is quite small being just 12 inches by 17 inches um, I didn't want it to have too much detail if I wanted to do a really detailed painting I'd want to work a lot bigger if I'd have worked too much detail into this tiny painting I think it would have looked false and it would have lost it the freshness um, that I was trying to achieve the whole idea I guess behind using watercolors is that they are transparent and you do want the light refracting through the layers um, bouncing back off the white paper and if I'd have gone in with a lot of detail a lot of that would have been lost a lot of that uh, translucency would have been lost so just keeping it nice and fresh nice quite loose really quite a loose painting and just building up the layers and you can build up color as well by glazing so if you're new to painting and you're unsure what glazing is it's just tinting a layer underneath with another layer on top so using transparent colors to to tint uh, existing colors so it's like looking through a stained glass window you can see what's on the other side of the window but what's on the other side of the window looks tinted by whatever color glass they've used in the window and that's all that glazing is make sure that your layer underneath is dry and then you can tint a different color over the top it doesn't completely alter the the, the color underneath the look of the color underneath because you're using transparent colors but it does tint it somewhat and that's what glazing is sorry about my hair getting in the way oh dear I'm back on with some more colour I added a little bit of red by the looks of it to this bit of pigment that's going on now just to warm it up a little bit there's a lot of benefits of working with um, a limited palette and one of them if you use just a limited palette for the whole of a painting for the background foreground mid ground and subject you get a sense of unity that I think you don't get if you're using lots and lots of colors if you were to use say three different colors for the background and then three separate colors for the subject and then maybe a couple more colors for the foreground you're not going to get that sense of unity um, that you would from using three colors throughout the whole of the painting you get three good colors together um, and you can mix a multitude of hues so as you can see you, the background looks completely different to the the reindeer in color and yet they've all been created with the same three colors so the, the amount of hues that you can mix from a limited palette is endless but it does give the painting unity and that's what I like about using a limited palette plus you don't need such a big ceramic palette you can have a little tiny ceramic palette 
next to you and do all your mixing on that because you're only using a limited amount of colours and you're less likely to create mud, <laughs> which is nice. I think you're more likely to create mud if um, you use translucent colours and opaque colours together because some watercolours are more opaque than others. So the best thing to do is just have a play around, get a little test piece of paper, try mixing colours. If you do choose three or four colours um, as a limited palette, have a play mixing, see what colours you can come up with. And if it doesn't work, swap one colour for a different colour and then try again. And in the end, you will find um, three, especially if you go for three primary colours, a blue, yellow and a, and a red, you will find three colours that suit your needs and then you can work from there. And then maybe just add one colour into it if you feel you just need a little bit more um, variation. So just about the whole of this painting was created using wet on wet techniques. Apart from the eye where I did use the uh, wet on dry. So blending that little bit out with a wet brush and as you can see the the stomach area the tummy area I went in with water and then just added a little bit of pigment at the bottom of the tummy and let it blend upwards turned the paper upside down for that so just adding water that was with a rosemary and rosemary and company brush it's a flat I'll put it all in the description below You can see now that the um, that stained patch on the body is slowly <laughs> working its way into the uh, patterning and texture of the fur on the body of the subject and by the end of the painting it's literally disappeared and blended in quite well to the um, layers that were put on top of it. If anywhere I went on with paint like I did just then and it was creating hard edges just go over it with a wet brush before it dries and just blend it out not a problem at all. So this video is about let's have a look about 42 minutes long um, so not not too long people have said they do prefer the longer videos maybe they're watching them too make them go to sleep I don't know I'm watching them at bedtime if you are enjoying um, my video then please hit like and subscribe if you haven't already it's really appreciated okay so I've just strengthened the pigment um, in the palette that's by using less water and applied it to the painting just to create um, a darker area there <clears throat> When you're using watercolours, it's always worth remembering that they do dry around about 25% lighter than when you put them on. That shift um, in colour, well, in depth, um, alters uh, the more or less water you use. So the more water you use, the bigger the colour shift when it, when it dries. So it's, uh, it can be a bit tricky for beginners sometimes that they think they're applying a nice dark wash and then when it's dry it's not as dark as when they applied it. And so just, just keep that in mind. It's the same as people working with gouache. Dark colours dry lighter and light colours dry darker in gouache. So that's a, a bit of a learning curve as well. I like to work in all different mediums. Um, there's a saying, isn't there? You can be the jack of all trades and master of none. But I think when it comes to working in different art mediums, the knowledge you gain from creating is transferable between mediums. So if you get the hang of colour mixing, contrast, hues and tones, things like that, doesn't matter what medium you're working in, you just take the, that um, knowledge with you to whichever medium you're working in so the um, it doesn't take so long to learn how to use a new medium and you can easily switch between mediums um, once you get the hang of it so okay so what the wetting wet uh, technique right across the subject itself 
let it dry finish drying it off with a hair dryer so everything's nice and stable and um, it's not going to shift too much and now I'm going to go on with the second layer onto the body of the caribou reindeer I said I'd into <laughs> interchange between those two terms I went to the Arctic in August and um, the reindeer the, on Svalbard, Spitsbergen, they're completely different to any reindeer you see anywhere else. They're a lot smaller and stockier. It's like a, a amazing to see how they've um, evolved to live there. It's, uh, they're, they're shorter and uh, amazing. But they are lovely animals, aren't they? Just uh, And he's, this one's not got a red nose and he hasn't got bells on him, so I can't call him Rudolph. <laughs> it definitely put me in the festive field doing this painting. So working wet on wet, so everything's going on with soft edges, keeping it all nice and soft. And as I said, if there's any hard edges appearing, just going in with a wet brush and just softening them out. The reference image I was using um, <coughs> for this, apart from having a head and antlers that I wasn't keen on and I ended up resketching, the actual uh, animal itself was very dark because it was partially backlit and I didn't want that effect in this painting because I think the um, having a, such a dark subject would have competed too much with the dark background. So the reference image has now been put away and I'm just creating this image how I want to see it, creating the painting how I want it to be. So there's a time and a place for a reference image but it's not needed throughout the whole of a painting. It's just to give you inspiration and give you some ideas, maybe give you a pose of a subject. Um, if you're working um, floral paintings and things like that, it can give you an idea of the veining on leaves or the veining structure on petals, um, colours and things. But then at some point it's nice just to put the reference image away and create the painting that you want to see. Going on with water again, just um, because the light's coming in from the right hand side, I don't want the back of that hind leg to have any um, hard edges at all because I want the light to be hitting that area. So I want the colours to soften. The further they go towards that edge, um, I want the colours to get lighter and lighter. This was such an enjoyable project. I really, really did enjoy painting this. There's really n not many paintings that I don't enjoy, but this was just lovely. It was, it was so relaxing to uh, create this and didn't take too long, really. I did it over a couple of days. So just because you've got a painting on the easel doesn't mean you You've got to sit at it until it's finished. I think sometimes you need a breather. You need to look at it with fresh eyes, uh, especially if you've been sitting in front of it for a few hours. Um, it can get a bit stale and you can lose your way sometimes on, on what you need to do. And walking away, getting a coffee, um, relaxing, reading a book or something like that, or doing some housework or whatever, you're cooking dinner or whatever, and then going back and having another look gives you fresh eyes, a fresh perspective um, on a painting and yeah, it just aids creativity sometimes just to have a break and come back with fresh eyes. As I said, I didn't want any real detailed areas and there was a shadowing area underneath the tail but I didn't want to make that too dark and too obvious because I didn't want the viewer's eye to be drawn to that end of the deer Obviously, I want the focus to be on the head of the deer. So the idea, was, the idea, no pun intended. The idea was just with a painting is to lead the viewer into the painting and give the viewer's eyes something to settle on. Um, 
and in this case it's the head of the deer. So just glazing some more colours onto that area and adding a little bit more colour to the back end. But try not to go too dark. Um, as I said, the lighting I've decided is coming in from, um, for my painting, is coming in from that area. And as I said, the reference image was backlit. Not, not what I wanted for this uh, painting. Just adding a little bit more pigment there, mixing up so many different hues in my palette just so it gives the painting um, interest. I've got as much texture onto the subject I feel I need and now I'm just shifting the hues and sh slightly shifting the values as well. If in doubt with uh, you know contrast and things like that just do little thumbnail sketches and figure out your contrast and where the light source is coming from uh, before you go on to your main painting and that helps a little bit too as I said I'm sorry if I'm, I've repeated myself but, but this is the second uh, voiceover recording I will do um, an actual uh, live painting session soon but uh, when you're painting and talking at the same time you can lose track of where you are in a painting it does make it a little bit more difficult um, I, I do teach as well and when I'm teaching I can paint and talk at the same time but I think that's a little bit different when you've not got a video running as well it's the fact that when you've got a video camera you have then well for me personally I know other artists do it but um, yeah, talking, painting and not getting in the way of video camera. Yeah, that's multitasking. Okay, so I've mixed up a little bit of the um, white gouache, added quite a bit of water to it, so it's uh, very fluid. Using the uh, number six Rosemary and Company brush and just getting in a little bit of texture around the edges. Now I go right the way around the deer, so along his neckline, under the stomach area, up the hind quarters, across the rump, along the back and up the neck. Um, and what I, did, what I did with this then is once I'd applied the gouache right the way around, I then dried it with a hair dryer. And I did keep the hair dryer on it for quite a while. I wanted to make sure nothing was going to shift because once this was dry, I then went on and I tinted all of this with yellows just so it looked like the sun or what you know the light source coming in from the right was just catching it and it just gave a little bit more um, dimension to the subject and a sense of the light coming in from the right it just added to that gouache as I said is watercolor it's just an opaque watercolor so even though I'm using gouache this can still be classed as a watercolor painting But you really do, if you do this um, glazing technique over gouache, just make sure that gouache is really, really dry. Um, because if it's not, it will just blend with the water glaze that you put on top and then you just end up with a milky looking mess. <laughs> Which is fine if that's what you want. If you want it to blend, then, then that's fine. Because you can actually remove it by add. If you put some gouache down where you don't want it, Get a clean brush just with water on it, wet it and then dab it off with a tissue and it removes it. But if you want it to stay put and it's a case of just glazing this, then just go on um, with a hairdryer and make sure it's completely dry or a hair to uh, a heat gun, sorry. There you go, so it's nice and dry. Add in a little bit of um, very watery pigment I'm not pressing on with the brush at all because I don't want to scrub away at the gouache and disturb it. So light hand tinting it and I went all the way around the body doing this. 
and now I'm flicking on some gouache uh, just to give it a snowy speckled look as you can see the paper is slightly cockled but that's not a problem at all uh, it didn't cockle too much at all I was able just to carry on painting kept drying it with a hairdryer and if you want to flatten it out what I do personally is I take it off the board wet the back of the painting very lightly put it back on the board piece of paper over the top weight it down with some books 24 hours time remove the books it's had time to dry time to flatten out and it's good to go well if you've made it this far thank you so much for being with me today please like and subscribe if you haven't already if you'd like me to cover any mediums or subjects or maybe a subject and in a certain medium drop it in the comments below uh, please share on social media if you want uh, with family and friends and that's it I've got lots to do in the studio so I will sign off for now until next time take care everybody stay creative and I will see you all soon bye bye